Hello and welcome to Africa Here and Now, the conversation you've always wanted to have about Africa. I'm Martine Dennis. Now, ECOWAS is under pressure to bring back Burkina Faso, Mali and Niger after the three military leaders announced their departure from the West African bloc. We ask ECOWAS political commissioner whether it can afford to lose the Sahelian trio at a time of great insecurity and deep economic woes. And is it even possible to have a political opposition in Zimbabwe as Nelson Chamisa quits the Triple C party, saying it's been infiltrated by the ruling ZANU-PF? And will the elephants trample the leopards? And can the super eagles trounce the boys? The AFCON semi-finals are almost upon us. Well, joining me to pick over these stories and add a few of their own are Donu Cogborough and Patrick Smith. Hello, Patrick. How are you? I'm fine, Martine. Thanks for asking. I've just had uh, 10 days in Ghana uh, checking out the next elections and uh, the ramifications of the Sahel exit, as people are calling West Africa's Brexit. Now I'm in Cape Town, uh, South Africa, at the beginning of the Indaba. All right. We're going to pick up on that a little bit later on, Patrick, particularly the Ghana side of your travels. Donu, you've also been on the road. You're in Port Harcourt. You're not in the, the Nigerian capital, Abuja. How are you today? Uh, I'm in Port Harcourt and um, in River State, and things here are very, very tense. Right. Let's get on to this ECOWAS story because it's being described as a crisis in West Africa. We're very pleased to be able to talk to Ambassador Abdul Musa. He's Commissioner of Political Affairs at ECOWAS, and he is talking to us from Abuja. Am I correct to use the word crisis to describe recent developments? Yeah, you, you're not uh, far from the truth. Uh, we are facing multiple crises, a convergence of uh, threats in the region. And uh, as we are even talking about the Sahel, we are also grappling with uh, an evolving crisis in Senegal, one of the beacons of democracy in West Africa, where the president has just uh, postponed seen the dear election that was supposed to take place uh, on the 25th of February. You know, so political security, you know, crisis and the Sahel exit, as uh, uh, Patrick, you know, just, uh, you know, mentioned earlier on. Yeah, so uh, we are facing multiple crises. That is correct. And ECOWAS itself has come in for quite a bit of criticism as to the way it's handling uh, these crises. I mean, the the Sahelian trio, as I'm calling them, uh, the military leaders of, of Mali, uh, Niger and Burkina Faso, they were all heavily critical of you guys, the leadership of ECOWAS, uh, saying that you're hypocritical and um, that you're not helping them face down their threats, the threats of insecurity, uh, not to mention their, their dire economic situations. Yes, um, you know, that is not exactly true. As we are speaking, uh, ECOWAS has already transferred over $8 million to those three countries uh, to help them mm, equip themselves somehow in the counter-terrorism efforts over there. But, uh, Martin, let me tell you one thing. All the three countries, uh, particularly Niger and Burkina Faso cited insecurity as the reason for them coming to power. And uh, insecurity is rather becoming worse and worse by the day. You know, so they should look at themselves and not the sub-regional organization that uh, they are pointing accusing fingers at. Well, they also said that they were reacting, their decision to quit uh, ECOWAS was a reaction to uh, the bungling, the mishandling, the, what they would consider the very, the overly severe reaction from ECOWAS, the kind of sanctions that have been slapped on them, particularly Niger, that has been starved of uh, electricity, for instance. Um, they say that that is, is, is ill-advised. Yeah, I would agree to some extent that probably the sequencing of uh, the sanctions against Niger were not very well handled, that I can admit. But let me tell you one thing. Uh, neither Burkina Faso nor Mali are under any severe sanctions as we speak. 
you know, so they do not have the same justification as Niger. It's only the formal sanctions that is um, uh, they are being barred from participating in decision making, you know, processes in ECOWAS. That is what is uh, uh, binding on Mali and Burkina. It is Niger that is having the wide-ranging sanctions. And the sanctions were imposed as a precondition for discussions. But since they are not ready to dialogue, that is why the sanctions are there. Um, but this is going to take, isn't it, I suppose, what you might call creative diplomacy? Uh, because ECOWAS can't really afford, can it, to lose three big members of its regional group. You've got plans. ECOWAS has got plans for much more reg regional integration. You can't press ahead with that with that, uh, missing these three important states? Um, yes, let me put the question the other way. Can those trial of states, Mali, Burkina Faso, and uh, Niger, also afford to miss the advantages that regional integration brings to them? It is mutual. It's mu interdependent. That is what ECOWAS is all about. We would really want them, you know, to remain in the community, and they have got one year uh, to think about it, and for the creative diplomacy, as you, you just mentioned, you know, to take hold. ECOWAS, um, you know, protocol, particularly the treaty, uh, you know, states categorically, in, uh, uh, what is it, in Article 91, you know, that um, any member state that wants to withdraw from ECOWAS would have to give a one-year notice. So during this period, a whole lot of efforts will be made to see whether, uh, you know, that, that we can save the divorce. And Donny? So I've got two questions for you. One, what have you got to offer anybody? That's one. And two, on what grounds do the ECOWAS leaders accuse anybody of being undemocratic? I mean, at least they're being open about their own undemocratic activities. Okay, yeah. Uh, listen, it, it is uh, very, you, you know, straightforward. ECOWAS is one of the sub-regional organizations, uh, you know, the, about the first in the world that actually, as far back as 1975, brought about the free movement of people's services in the region. That already is... But why is that a good thing? Well, that's a good thing. Uh, the three countries that we are referring to are among the most impoverished in the region. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire alone is hosting about 5 million citizens of Burkina Faso, hosting about 2 to 3 million from Niger, hosting uh, about the same number of people from uh, Mali. They have job opportunities in those countries that are better off economically, you know, than them. And this is a clear advantage of, uh, you know, the benefits of the regional integration that we are talking about. Because there is visa-free travel in the sub-region, people take it for granted. You know, but uh, if they withdraw, you know, then that the populations will realize uh, with a lot of trade in West Africa being informal, uh, it is the ordinary people who are going to suffer because the free movement is helping them a lot to integrate and to settle and to uh, do business in all the member states of the country. That is the very first point. The second is that of solidarity. That of solidarity, uh, any problem that afflicts any of the member states is considered uh, an affliction on the entire region. And ECOWAS has got the, uh, what is it, uh, the um, uh, capacity, uh, you know, to help them come out of it. We have also got rules of engagement, you know, that everybody, in, in order to promote democracy, in order to promote human rights and others. So it is a rules-based uh, regional institution, you know, that I think uh, set the rule for constitutional convergence criteria in, this, uh, in the sub-region. On the second, uh, democracy... Excuse me, sir, can I briefly interrupt you? Okay. I didn't see any solidarity when the Nigerian elections were rigged and we were robbed of our real president. 
In fact, the guy who cheated is now your president, your chairman. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, that is your that is your view. I think uh, what we work with is laws of the country and uh, those who love the election. And let me tell you, it is only in Nigeria that I uh, first uh, observed that three candidates who contested the presidential election all claimed they had won. <laughs> normally, <laughs> normally, it's only uh, you know, the one who wins and the one who loses. But now we've got three candidates who all thought they were the winners. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court in Nigeria, and the Supreme Court has ruled. So I think it is important for us to uh, also obey, uh, you know, the, the, the rule of law uh, as, you know, we speak. In terms of rigging of election, I feel that the most important way to prevent it is for uh, the building of the capacity of the political parties in order to police their vote. That has been a lacuna in many of the activities of the political parties in our region, and ECOWAS is actually engaged today in trying to build internal capacity of these political parties to make sure that they are able to, uh, you know, uh, to, to monitor and then to protect their vote. That has helped a number of countries, particularly in places like Senegal where the vigilance of the population has made rigging virtually impossible in that country. And this is where we are heading. That is that on the it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't stop them uh, uh, cancelling or postponing elections indefinitely, does it? I mean, this is a problem. Uh, you know, of course, and that is exactly uh, what I started with by talking about the postponement of the elections in the Senegal. But I can tell you one thing. Civil society and the structures, institutions in Senegal are said that this problem will be overcome. And ECOWAS is working very assiduously with all partners to make sure that uh, this does not uh, degenerate into crisis in the country. Because we've seen demonstrations in the country being suppressed and then all that. And ECOWAS is engaging all the stakeholders. As we speak, our advanced uh, electoral observation team is in Dakar and other places monitoring the situation very closely. And ECOWAS is already, the, the, the issue is on the front burner. ECOWAS cannot afford to lose one of the stars of democracy in West Africa, and that is, uh, you know, Senegal. Liberal democracy, as it is practiced in Africa generally today, is only about three decades old, about 30 years, you know, old. And even, you know, countries that have practiced liberal democracy for centuries are still having challenges. The United States uh, and other countries, you can just mention them, you know, in the north. Uh, but within this period, Africa has already had about 31 alternations of power, something that was impossible, uh, you know, some years back before 1990. So that is it. We are in a situation where incumbents are being defeated at the ballot box. That was impossible before, you know, in Africa. So it is like the glass is half full uh, and not half empty. We need rather to give uh, what a development content to liberal democracy and not reduce democracy to just periodic elections. And that is the real challenge that we have on the continent, and that is what all stakeholders have to contribute towards uh, ensuring you know, that uh, we can uh, protect democracy by making sure that the, 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 the dividends of liberal democracy is felt by the people in terms of development, in terms of social services, in terms of employment opportunities to the vast majority of the young people that we have on the continent today. Dr. Musa, do you think there's a danger of this fight within ECOWAS between the Sahelian trio and the rest of the countries becoming another sort of battleground for geopolitical rivalries? Because, I mean, one of the claims of the Sahelian hunters is that ECOWAS and particularly Nigeria have come under undue influence from the neo-colonial powers. That is uh, one of the 
challenges that the region is facing, uh, the geostrategic and geopolitical, you know, interests uh, in the region, particularly in the Sahel, is said that we are gradually drifting towards a new Cold War in, you know, uh, uh, Africa. We had, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, virtual, a virtual unipolar world, uh, which now uh, is now gradually turning into a multipolar reality as far as Africa is concerned. You talked about the, 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 the uh, collective West, the U.S. and its allies on the one hand, China, Russia on the other. You just mentioned the Middle Eastern countries. And in Africa itself, we can see the interplay between the, uh, the rivalry between Morocco and Algeria also impacting what is happening in those uh, three countries. That, that is a real fear. Uh, the challenge is this, uh, you know, Patrick, if these countries are seeing that ECOWAS is being, uh, you know, influenced from outside, you know, the continent, particularly the, uh, what they see as the, uh, the, the, the influence of France, on whatever is happening. It's ironic, you know, that those three countries are withdrawing from ECOWAS and not from UEMOA, yeah. which is the West African, uh, you know, Francophone countries block in the region, which was actually created with the facilitation of France itself. Those three countries are still using the Franc CIFA, which is guaranteed by France itself. You know, and so, putting uh, their money is, in the French Central Bank in Paris. They keep their exactly. money in the French Central Bank in Paris. You know, that's, that's the reality. You know, Dr. Musa, should that stop? So, is it yes. time that we just rethought this whole relationship? And, I mean, there's been talk about a West African currency for a long time, bringing mm -hmm. in Nigeria, bringing in Ghana, an independent West African currency. Is this now mm -hmm. time to get into some serious talks about this? And that might be some way of bringing these people back into a, a, a stronger, more independent West African regional organization? Yes. Uh, the common currency for West Africa, the ECO, has been a shifting target, you know, for ECOWAS right. since its inception. And it is something that we are very, very focused on, uh, you know, because what is happening in the uh, region, uh, you know, Patrick, Martin and others, you know, is the fact that uh, this kind of a partner shopping, uh, you know, in the region, is becoming such a major challenge for the sub-region. You reject the, uh, one country and then you go for the other. Niger is a clear example of that, where you still have the Germans, you still have the Americans, and then they are also flirting with the Russians while they are kicking the French out. It's a very confused situation, you know, so this kind of uh, strategic choices are uh, the right of every, uh, you know, sovereign state. But right. uh, it is about the inability to chart a strategic exit from dependency. Are you aware that the ordinary people in, in African countries are pro what is happening in Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, that there's a lot of support for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, look, uh, we have to, uh, you know, sort of take to, um, uh, into account the influence of technology today, information, disinformation, and all that. Uh, but uh, if they also know the downside of what is happening in some of those countries, I think, you know, where uh, critics of even the handling of the insecurity in places like Burkina Faso uh, actually brings about requisitioning of critics being armed, being trained for three days and being thrown to the front to go and then fight the terrorists. Africa, up until about 1990, had serious experiences with military regimes. Unfortunately, uh, today's young people, 30 years and below, have never tasted military rule in the country. So they see the romantic side of it, but when the reality starts biting, they will see what a military rule actually is. Now then, let's go to Zimbabwe. 
The opposition there is in crisis. That's the second time I've used the word in this episode. Nelson Chamisa, the leader of the Triple C, announced he's quitting the party that he himself formed only about what, two years ago. I've lost track of the number of iterations that political opposition has taken in Zimbabwe. We had the MDC, the Movement for Democratic Change, led by Morgan Changarai. He did well in elections, ended up being part of a government of national unity. Anyway, that was then. This is now. Is it possible to really have a political opposition in Zimbabwe today? We have with us Saviour Kasukwere. Thank you for joining us, Xavier. Now, Xavier used to be a very prominent member of ZANU-PF under Robert Mugabe, a younger member, the new guard you were, weren't you, of ZANU-PF uh, for a long time. And then, uh, as you know, there was a coup in Zimbabwe and uh, Munangagwa has uh, taken the reins. And Xavier Kasukwere entered the uh, political sphere again, didn't you, as an independent. You ran in last August's elections as an independent um, but you were barred for technical reasons. You know the situation from both sides, which is why it's so important to talk to you. Is it possible, therefore, to have a political opposition in Zimbabwe when we have just seen uh, what Nelson Chamisa calls the infiltration of his Triple C party by ZANU-PF, rendering it pretty much useless? Zimbabwe has become very difficult politically. Why do I say that? And I, in fact, I'm assisted by the presentation that was made by my dear brother, Dr. Musa, on the crisis in West Africa. Once you have a government that has taken over power through an unconstitutional means, forget about using constitutional means to remove it. And this is clear about Zimbabwe. I mean, I can tell you here that uh, I stood, uh, I wanted to stand as, um, to change, to, to, to challenge Emerson Nangago, but they put so many technical pillars along the way. And you can appreciate the judges, why they have to make certain decisions. You can appreciate why even the police have to make certain decisions. Because at the back, those who took power unconstitutionally want to protect themselves. And the first thing they do is never allow an opposition to come into play. So, Savior, can I, can I just cl get you to clarify that? Are you saying that the judges... They have to, they're duty bound to rule in favour of the ruling party uh, in order to save their own skins because they're effectively they're captured. Of course. Who does them outside the, their, their door? Just outside the gate, if there's a member of the army, if there's a policeman who's part of the regime, when they go to their homes, they're guarded by the same people. Now, how much can they uh, be able to do? which will offend the ruling junta and get away with it. So my criticism is that we have allowed the junta, the military regimes, to take over power in many African countries. You recall that actually the first one was the Mugabe regime, and the Mugabe's removal, and thereafter we've got all this in West Africa. That is now happening. And AU has basically folded its arms we are going to see more and more of these developments. We are no longer sticking to the rules and regulations that were agreed to uh, when we transformed from the OAU to AU, the Peace and Security Architecture. All those things are no longer in place now. Whatever they say. So you're saying that uh, the government of ZANU-PF is effectively a military government? Owing to how it came into being, okay, to be honest with you, this is a military regime. Hence, when it decides, you can't go against it. We want our country to develop. We want our country to be one of those countries in the region which will make a good contribution. But you can't do it because the powers that be are so carefully watching whoever is coming to the door. Is he going to work against us or do they want my power? Now, because of that, but Xavier, can I can I jump in there? Because um, so many Zimbabweans, if not other uh, people around the world, are going to say, "Well, you were you were integral to the kind of regime that is now in place." I mean, not not much has changed since uh, the M Mugabe government was was taken out. You were part of it, um, and you obviously didn't mind. 
you didn't do anything to um, advocate for a fairer, freer, democratic space for opposition parties then, and you're only complaining now because you're not part of the in crowd. Martin, let's be honest. When 2008, the elections brought Shanghai with over at least 100 seats, we accepted it. When the referendum was held and ZANUS supports sponsorship of the Triple C, the Constitutional Commission, it was welcomed. And even then, you could still work the numbers from the ward to the district, to the parliament, and to the president. You, those numbers were there for all of us to see. But today's election, have you ever seen the tabulation of how much Amazon got in the various provinces? There's nothing like that. You just have the president or the chairperson of the Constitutional Commission going in front of the nation. Six minutes, she announces who has won and who has lost. Done deal. You asked me, I was a member of the PFS, but in as much as we could, we did things by the book. The judges were free to make decisions. But today, you have a different kind of uh, fish. So when Chamisa leaves the Triple C party, saying it's been infiltrated by ZANU-PF, uh, the, the idea of him forming another party, is it, is it even worthwhile forming another political party while the situation is as it is in Zimbabwe today? I have spoken to Nelson. Um, I only read the statements that he has made with regards to him quitting his political party. Uh, I'm not sure the wisdom of it, how he has evaluated the situation. Was it the best thing to do? Do you lose all the ground you have or you try and defend that democratic space you have uh, inch for inch and at least keep yourself with a voice? But I can understand maybe his frustrations were also internal within his own political party. And uh, things like them not having a constitution, uh, clarity in terms of roles, open the floodgates for infiltrators to come into the party. So they left the door open at night and the intruders came. Certainly in politics, if you leave a door open, your enemies will come in. They will be stupid not to use that opportunity. I would have thought by the time they were going to elections, at least a structure of some sort, which shows who has to do what, would have been the correct uh, position. But that is it may be, this is where we are. Going to this um, uh, further down to the politics of our country, he's been trying to fight hard, but you need much more energy and batteries to deal with that government if you have to win the elections. Zimbabwe requires a different sort of negotiation and a discussion to say, let's sit on the table. What are the fears of the generals? What do they want? How can we then all go to the world, work on sanctions, bring about a new Zimbabwe where everybody can be free? As it stands, even the people in the country are in trouble. They are not happy. They are basically just being boxed in. That is not good for any nation. We want Zimbabwe to be prospering. Sevi, you, you mentioned that the opposition needs to reorganise itself, perhaps find some way to sit down with the government and renegotiate the, the terms of engagement. I mean, people have talked about, you know, con a, a kind of national conference type affair. Um, it seems that all the reforms that were agreed in, in the wake of the very violent elections in 2008, not many of those reforms of the constitution have actually been implemented. If we take our people seriously, this is what we must do. We must put the people first and our individual selves last. We should be prepared to sit down with Zimbabweans and hammer out a long lasting political architecture that makes everybody relevant. Zimbabwe today, as you have correctly said, the economy is not doing well. They, we are still under sanctions, we're doing all these other things. It's because there is too much smoke in the cockpit. Um, Xavier, do you think that there's any chance of um, Zimbabwe or any African country really hitting the sweet spot in terms of democracy anytime soon? I have my doubts because most of the, our leaders go into power with one objective, to steal and fulfill their families. 
when they campaign to be presidents, it's because they want to enjoy the trappings of power and make money. Now, mm -hmm. until and unless we have transparency, leaders who can say, this is what I had before I become president or prime minister, and this is what I have as I exit, forget it. Okay, can I jump in and say a big thank you to Xavier Kasukwere? Thank you so much for your time, Xavier. Good to see you again. Thank you. Right, we need to press on and talk to Donu about her subject because uh, we've been talking about Zimbabwe, haven't we? And we're staying in that region because the president of Namibia, Hagi Gaingob, has sadly died. Um, but he's impressed you very much, Donu, hasn't he? You've been telling me he, he's impressed you with his, his style of leadership. On Sunday morning, the president of Namibia died. And I've never come across so many people feeling sad about the passing of an African head of state. And the reasons are really very simple and only go to show that if you behave well, people will like you and might even vote for you. You might not even have to rig an election. And why was President Gaingob so popular? And so why were people so sad when he passed away on Sunday morning? Because when he got sick, he was very open about it. He told the world what was wrong with him. And then he said he was going up to America for treatment and that he was going to pay for it himself. And then he said that the doctors, the Namibian doctors, would be given an opportunity to monitor what the American doctors were doing and be trained by them and learn from them so that they could apply what they had picked up um, for the benefit of Namibians who cannot afford expensive medical treatment abroad. You know, we, we don't ask for too much in Africa and we get so little. And uh, that man, I mean, that was heroic by the standards of African presidents. And so let me just say, on behalf of myself and so many, many, many of my friends and colleagues in Nigeria, rest in peace, President Gangob. We respected you tremendously and your passing, we believe, is a great loss to your people. A lesson in leadership. Uh, there's Donu reflecting on the life of Hagi Gaingob. Thanks for that, Donu. Now, Patrick, you are globe trotting or continent trotting. Can you say that? You are in Cape Town uh, at the mining in Daba, but I think we're rather more interested today in hearing about your reflections on what's going on in Ghana as they enter a pre-election period. Um, I'm always, I'm always rather amused, if you like, by the fact that Ghana's elections are always overshadowed by the US election. They, their, their election cycles mirror one another's, but nobody cares really what's going on in Accra, except us, of course, and everyone's rather in raptures about what's going on in Washington, DC. So what did you observe? Well, yeah, you're right uh, in making that parallel, Martin. Um, because like the American elections, the Ghana elections are already in full swing. You, you think the elections were tomorrow if you were in Accra today. Uh, there are posters all over the city um, of the certainly of the main opposition candidate, John Dramani uh, Mahama, who used to be president until 2016, but also of this new contender, a guy called Nana Kwame Bediako. And uh, they, um, he has the biggest posters in town, bigger even than the vice president of the government, Mah Mahamadou Bawumia. Um, and that, ra that raises questions of where his money is <laughs> coming from. He's got this uh, amazing following, mainly confected on social media. He invited Julius Malema and Peter Obi and Patrice Lumumba, not the Patrice no. Lumumba, but his <laughs> Kenyan namesake, who's known as a sort of radical anti-corruption campaigner in Kenya, invited them to, to Black Star Square, which again is the sort of the big uh, political meeting place established by Kwame Nkrumah, whatever, 70 years ago almost. And the government suddenly decided that they needed to use Black Star Square for something else, and the rally was cancelled. But uh, the thing about Bediako is that he's debonair, he dresses very well, looks like a movie star and all of that. And I think there's... That's created a bit of a wave behind him. But I mean, a lot 
some of the older heads are saying, what does this guy actually stand for, except that he's none of the above? And I think that's, um, that is his strongest point. Thank you for that, Patrick. We are going to keep a close eye on Ghana as it prepares for its election. Right, we're going to have a look at the football now and we're going to talk to Gary Al Smith, the, the rather well-known football pundit and uh, sports journalist. He is in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. So, Gary, we've got DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, the Leopards, playing the Elephants, the Ivory Coast. Then we've got uh, Nigeria, the Super Eagles, taking on Bafana Bafana, the boys from South Africa. Who do you fancy for the semis? Well, it depends on whether you're asking me as a Ghanaian, which I'm sure you are not, or as an analyst, which I'm sure you are. If you're asking me as a <laughs> Ghanaian, I, there's a lot that is wrong with that question because to our west is our neighbor Cote d'Ivoire. Very noisy, but absolutely not as noisy as our neighbor three doors down Nigeria and absolutely not as noisy as our southern most neighbor that's South Africa. So you see where we have a problem. Like three out of the four countries, we absolutely would not want to win, which is statistically impossible. So <laughs> if you're asking me as a Ghanaian, I'm telling you that <laughs> I want none of them to win. <laughs> as an analyst, though, seriously, in just, in just 15 seconds, I think Nigeria have the the best uh, chance because they have grown in what they call, they, they are a proper tournament team. Um, guess what? They have played the Africa Cup of Na Nations 19 times. This is their 19th. And 16 times they have gotten to the semifinal. That is phenomenal. That Absolutely. is phenomenal. Absolutely. So like, they know how to play these things. Unfortunately, they don't know how to win it when they get to the semi-final. <laughs> so that's what they are trying to, and they are looking good. I mean, I mean, typical of the way Nigerians like to do things in other sectors. You know, they find there is a chaotic way to the, the the way they are playing. That's just beautiful to watch as well. So my money will be on Nigeria. Yes, beautiful chaos. All right, Donu, what do you think of that? Your national team. I don't want politicians to exploit the euphoria that will follow. And I don't want the wrong people to get credit for any victory. Same same situation in Ghana as well. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know, you can just imagine all these these guys, the 11 guys, they've worked so hard, they've used their skills, and then some dodgy people come in and say, well, you know, they they, they, they benefit from the rush of emotion. Patrick, you were particularly interested in Cabo Verde, the tiny little islands that are doing so well, or have done. Yeah, Gary, I, I wondered what you made of Cabo Verde's um, stellar performance. A tiny country. I was in Cabo Verde myself, just very recently, to shoot a documentary on precisely what they are doing right. So I happen to have been, yes, in the midst of it. Now, there is a fund, think of it as an IMF fund, that almost all countries have access to, especially the developing countries. In this case, it's called the FIFA Forward Program. So it's basically, you know, FIFA have a freak load of money lying around. And now, because there's always a lot of problem and corruption allegations, they find ways to share some of the money to their federations just to justify that. Yeah, we are giving the money to people to develop. And all, that. all developing countries have it. But because of how shrouded in secrecy FIFA operate, a lot of countries are unable to tell what exactly their money goes for. Some countries, though, and we've seen a few of them do so well at the AFCON in recent years, precisely because this is money their governments will not give them, but FIFA gives it to them and they use it judiciously. Enter Cape Verde. They've used their money for talent development, talent identification, building infrastructure, that ordinary Ordinarily, an island nation like them would not be able to afford. At voila, from 2013, they've been punching above their weight and you are seeing them do this well as well. I am told that in other sectors of their country, in an economy and stuff like that, they are investing quite wisely, you know, similarly as they are doing in their football. And that's why you are suddenly hearing, oh, keep that this, keep that that, in not just sports, but in this and that and this and that. So simple answer, really. Because they're wonderful, wonderful leadership. Yeah. 
And then I was going to ask you, this, um, did you say South Africa and Nigeria were going to play each other? Yes. Yeah, I'm a it's piano be daddy, a they call it. Oh, is this going to be a bloodbath? I mean, you see what happens whenever South Africans decide that Nigerians are obnoxious. And there's so many allegations. Yes, so there's something so there's something that's not savory going on, unfortunately, since the draw was made. There's been the outpouring of what you're talking about with Nigerians openly calling out other Nigerians in South Africa to be extra careful before, during, and after the game, especially if Nigeria were to win. They should leave. Because because of previous happenings. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I mean, it's gotten so bad on social media that Nigerians are saying, and this is funny and not funny, that even if, if, even if Nigeria were to beat South Africa, Nigerians should not throw South Africans, they should throw Ghanaians. <laughs> because we are the easier target. And I mean, you know, we are going to leave it as social media trolling. But the allegation is that anytime, and like you said, this is not based on any any trivial or puffy thing. It seems to be fact that when South Africa are beaten by Nigeria in football or anything, it goes into the streets. You know, yeah. so there is that unsavory thing that's happening as well. Is let nobody deceive you. What's going to happen in that semi-final is, is far more than football where Nigeria, South Africa have concerned. What has made things even worse is that yesterday or slash this morning at the Grammys, Nigeria were heavy favorites to win the African category. They had three, at least three or four artists in there and the lone South African in the category won the category. So, mm -hmm. yo... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, honestly, the allegations against Nigeria by South Africans, I mean, they're multiple. I mean, apart from the economic envy, there are legitimate complaints about um, obnoxiousness. Nigerians can be very obnoxious. Oh, yeah. As anybody who knows me knows. Um, then there's the fact that Nigerian men are always stealing South African women. This is what a South African guy said to me. They should Hallelujah leave our women alone. Hallelujah to that. Hallelujah to that. <laughs> it's such a big deal. Like, and it's all over social media. It's a big and you deal. see the Nigerians saying, well, this is why we take your women. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, yeah. It's far more so than I, a football match. I told them, and do you know what the Nigerian politician said to me? When I said, oh, God, they've started whinging about the women thing again. And he said, okay, so we steal their women. Well, if they had any balls, they would steal them back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we 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 did we we did touch on balls. Thank you very much indeed, <laughs> Donu. Because it started off as football, uh, a football chat, and uh, we have encompassed all manner of things. Gary L. Smith, thank you so much. It's always Really good to chat to you. That was very yes, funny, and I don't know that I've I've got a favourite for the for the uh, semis or indeed for the finals, but I've certainly had a bit of a laugh. So Gary Al Smith, thank you so much for talking to us. I want Cape Verde to win. No, they're already out, Don. They're already oh, out. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for this edition of Africa Here and Now. Get in touch, martine at africahereandnow.com. We're also on YouTube, Instagram, and of course, wherever you get your podcasts. Please like, subscribe, and share. Now, we're an independent podcast. We get behind the headlines and we dig deeper into what's happening in Africa. We don't take ads or sponsorship. But if you like what we do, please consider becoming a paid subscriber so we can continue the conversations that we like to have and keep us honest. Go to the www.africaheareandnow.com website to find out more about us, about our guests. You can listen to all the episodes there and you can find out how you can help us continue doing the work that we love. We recorded this on Monday the 5th of February. Our producer is Anne Busby. We got extra help from Tyler Hilton. Our original music is by Enric Adam. Chris at the podcast company put it all together. So thanks to our guests, Ambassador Musa, Xavier Casacuere, Gary Al Smith, 
And from Patrick, Donu and me, thank you for your company.